you got your Bible tonight, I want you to go ahead and take it out and turn to the book of Matthew 28 again. Matthew 28 again. Uh, we did this a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the Lord just keeps drawing my heart back to this idea and concept of discipleship. And so, Matthew chapter 28, um, verse number 18 through 20. I want to read that for us again. And I know that it is very familiar, but it is still relevant today. Uh, here's what the scripture says. Just stay seated there. We'll get to some more passages in a few minutes. But Matthew chapter, 20, chapter 28, verse 18 through 20 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Father, we ask you to speak to us tonight. Lord, I pray, God, that you would guard our minds as we hear something so simple, yet so often we hear it, that you would guard our minds to continue to receive it. I pray, God, that you'd give us a fresh word tonight, an encouragement tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be about being disciple makers. Speak to our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. I heard a story. Uh, it was about this zoo somewhere. I don't even know where it was at, but true story. And in this zoo, they had a bunch of elephants. And the elephant population began to grow rather large to where it began to be overpopulated with all of these elephants. And so uh, the the biologists and stuff got together and they said, we're going to have to do something about this because we're not going to be able to take care of all of these elephants. So something has to happen. And so what they started doing was they started getting rid of the older elephants. And so as they began to get rid of the older, particularly the older male elephants, something crazy began to happen. After a few months of all of these male, older elephants being gone, the younger male elephants began to be very rambunctious. They began to get wild. They, they began to get crazy in there. They started tearing up the zoo. They started tearing up the place. So the biologists came back together and said, Hold up, time out, wait a minute, this ain't going to work. This formula that we've gotten to get rid of all of these older elephants and just leave the younger, more healthy elephants, that's not working. We've got to do something. And so they started slowly but surely taking other male older elephants and putting them back into the zoo. And it didn't take but just a little time, just a little time, before all of the male, young male elephants began to act right. So, preacher, why do you tell that story? I tell that story because that's a story of discipleship. That is a story of the younger needing the older. Amen? To help pour wisdom. I mean, it, I'm sure it didn't take but a few weeks for a younger elephant to get out of line and the older element, elephant to hook him one good time, and he realized that ain't good. And so, it's a picture of discipleship. And Certainly, you could use that as a picture of the male leadership role as well, but it is a picture of discipleship. Listen, discipleship is important in the life of the church, and I'm convinced, uh, I mean, listen, I'm convinced that a healthy church is a church that has all ages of people. That's what I'm convinced of. I, I don't ever want to be a person that promotes um, only a church that would have only young people. I don't want to be a person that would promote a church that only has older people, that only has middle-aged people. I want to be a pastor that promotes a church that would have all age groups of people because I believe that all age groups of people are necessary for the body of Christ to be healthy. For the body of Christ to exercise discipleship like it needs to, we need the older and we need the younger. Now, two weeks ago, uh, last week we did Philip's ordination service, but two weeks ago we talked about Discipleship 101, and we discovered in that message that discipleship involves a teacher and a student. 
The teacher must be willing to pour information into the student and the student must be willing to receive. Now listen carefully. I want you to hear this. In order for you to walk away tonight, having been better by being here, you have to have been willing to listen. Amen? I have to have been willing to pour something out and you have to have been willing to listen to what I'm pouring out. And so it is a student-teacher relationship at this time. Now, there are times whenever I'm the student, you're the teacher. Does that make sense? Everybody picking up what I'm putting down? But in this moment, I'm the teacher, you're the student. And in order for you to receive that which I'm pouring out to you, you have to be willing to listen. And so we see that in the process of discipleship. And of course, we talked about last time that we know that the teacher carries a greater responsibility in the sense that he is the one that is setting the example to the student. So it's important how the teacher conducts his life. It is important how the teacher lives, breathes, walks, talks, and all of that good stuff. So listen to this. We talked about how it was important that the teacher be faithful to spend time with God personally in His Word and that it is important for that teacher not only to spend time in God's Word himself but to be able to pour that Word out on somebody else. Amen? Because listen to me, as God is pouring the Word into you, it's important that you pour the Word back out on somebody else as a disciple maker. And so the teacher needs to do that. Secondly, we talked about how the teacher needs to be a faith, they need to be faithful to attend regularly. Amen? I mean, it's just important for a person who desires to be a disciple maker to be in that place where they are gathering together to worship Jesus together and be equipped, right? So it's important for them to faithfully attend. It's also important for them to faithfully invest intentionally and carefully, methodically into the life of someone else. And then we also talked about they had to be faithful to continue growing as a disciple themselves. If you ever get to the place to where you think you got it all figured out, you're in a bad spot. <laughs> if you ever get to the place to where you feel like you can't learn something from somebody else, you're in a bad place, a really bad place. So as a disciple maker, we've got to make sure that we are continuing to grow. Listen to this. It's through the disciple maker's effort to grow in their faith that the disciple, the one that they're discipling, sees what they have the potential to become. See, as a disciple maker, you ought to be pouring out things into someone else. They ought to be able to watch your life. And as they watch your life and they listen to you and they learn from you, they ought to be able to look at your life and say, Man, I could become like that if I would just listen and I would learn and I would exercise obedience and faith. You say, Preacher, I don't know about all that. Well, Paul gave us that illustration in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Paul's the one that said, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. So Paul was not afraid to tell people, hey, you watch me and do what I do. And the reason he wasn't afraid to do that is because Paul knew that he was trying to do what Jesus was doing. And so whenever you're living that kind of life and you're wanting to be a disciple maker and invest in other people, you don't mind saying, hey, watch me do what I do, not because I'm all of that, but because I'm trying to do what Jesus wants me to do. You say, preacher, what if I tell people to watch me and I mess up? The Bible's got a remedy for that. It's called repentance. It's called let them see you repent. Let those you are discipling see you repent and get back to where you need to be. And in doing so, what you have done is shown them how to repent and get back to where they need to be when they mess up. Because I, can I get a witness? We all going to do something dumb. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, you already have. That's right. <laughs> So, so we made this statement as well. We made this statement that the beauty of discipleship is that you get to help someone else look more like Jesus. And that is a joy, amen? So that's what we talked about in Discipleship 101. So I just want to give you a little nugget 
on Discipleship 201. So I'm going to bring all you college folks back to college, right? Discipleship 201. So I want us to look a little bit deeper at this idea of discipleship and see how we can help the younger generation, those of us who are not in the younger generation anymore, maybe we can learn some things about how to uh, disciple those who are below us in age and maybe in spiritual maturity. So we've got a clear, pretty clear-cut instruction in the book of Titus of how the church is supposed to be set up, how the church is supposed to be run, how discipleship is supposed to be practiced in the church. Now keep this in mind. Um, The book of Titus, the Apostle Paul wrote that to Titus, who is a young preacher uh, who he released, okay? He released him to this place, this church in Crete, that he might set in order the church so that the church could be effective disciple makers that it might impact and advance the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to read Titus chapter 2 verse 2 through 8 says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled or sober, and sound in faith and love and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live. Not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that, that, that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about you or about us. Now, when you look in that passage of Scripture, here's what you're going to see. Y'all ready for it? You're going to see discipleship, 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 discipleship. That's what you're going to see. In setting the church in order, it's all about discipleship. So as you look at discipleship, what does this say that the older men ought to do? Number one, they ought to be temperate. They ought to be temperate. They ought to have, be mild-tempered. Amen? Now, how many of y'all find it difficult sometimes when you're dealing with a younger generation to be temperate? Anybody? Any take? Amen. Thank you, Brother David. You're the only one. But the Bible, yeah, now y'all are like, oh, and like, whoa, yeah, we talking about men right now, Melissa. Well, yeah, See, all the ladies are like, oh, ooh, me too. I'm like, we're not talking about you yet. So the men are to be very temperate. They ought to be mild-tempered. And the reason for that is because those that you are discipling as an older man, they're going to do things that are going to be frustrating. They're going to do things that are just, for the lack of a better Greek word, that's ignorant. Amen? They're going to do some ignorant stuff. And so you've got to make sure that you exercise mild-temperedness so that you can deal with them and help them move from where they are to where God wants wants them to be and then the scripture says that the older men ought to be worthy of respect worthy of respect you say preacher what on earth is that talking about well it's just simple it's living your life in such a way that when others look at you they respect the way you live they may not agree with everything that you agree with but they respect you because you have lived with honor and you have lived with integrity And so the older gentlemen ought to live that way. They also ought to live self-controlled. They ought to be sober, it says. Self-control, that simply means that they ought to be guided by the Holy Spirit of God. Because the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And so if they are encouraged to be self-controlled, then they ought to be following the Holy Spirit of God so that they could obtain the self-control. Has anybody in this room ever withstood the Holy Spirit, said no to the Holy Spirit at a moment of frustration and anger, and all of a sudden you lashed out and it wasn't anything closely resembling control? Amen. Praise God. At least we don't have a bunch of liars in the house tonight. Amen. So they ought to be self-controlled. And then he goes on to say this, that they ought to be sound. They ought to be sound in their faith. I mean, listen, when we say sound, here's what I think about when I think about sound. I think they ought to be, number one, sound in their doctrine. Right? Sound in doctrine. Sound in their faith. They ought to be steadfast. 
rock solid in their faith for the Lord Jesus. They ought to be sound in love. They ought to be sound in patience. In other words, they ought to be able to exercise and be really good at exercising patience. And that comes in handy because, let's just be honest, the older gentlemen in the body of Christ are the primary example setters. Are they supposed to be? Amen? Can I get a whip? That was a good place for y'all to say amen, especially the men that are older gentlemen. Right? So he says, in the body of Christ, the older men ought to be these things so that they can disciple the others. And then, listen, he mentions the older ladies as well. He mentioned the seasoned ladies. Let me change that. The seasoned ladies. That they ought to be reverent in how they live. They ought to be reverent in how they live. Listen, ladies, you ought to love God with all your heart. And you ought to live that way. Amen? You ought to be respectable. You ought to be reverent, honoring God, honoring this thing called the dignity of life as you live life within the body of Christ. And then he goes on to say this, that they're not to be slanderers. Say, what is that? Well, some translations say malicious gossipers. Hello, somebody. You ought not be a gossiper. Why is that? Because that doesn't set a good example for the younger generation. And we're going to see that in a few minutes. So he says, don't be slanderers. Don't be malicious gossipers. And then he says, not addicted to wine. Or not given to much wine. You say, preacher, wait a minute. Well, let me ask you a question. Let me just, let me go and throw this out there. We don't have time to get into this debate, but let me just say this to you. I'll go ahead and tell you now, I'm a teetotaler. I just believe in don't do it at all, period. Even if you got liberty, don't do it. It's it's not worth it. Why, Why does he say, why does he say this to the older ladies and not necessarily when we get to the younger ladies? He doesn't say that to the younger ladies. Could it, could it be? Could it be maybe a couple of reasons? Um, number one, wine then is not the same as it is now. It's not necessarily some recreational thing, though you could have gotten drunk off some of that wine. It wasn't a recreational drink. Or could it be that at the age that they were at, that they used it for medical purposes? And so he says, you better be very careful as you use that for medical purposes because you can get addicted to that and you don't need to be addicted to that because he said it to the older, but he didn't say it to the younger. So very well could be, but let me just solve this issue right now, at least as far as this sermon is concerned. How, what is the best way to not get addicted to wine? What? What? You're kidding. Don't drink it. That's the best thing to do. That's the most wise thing for the believer to do. So he says to the older ladies, he says, don't be addicted to wine or don't be given to much wine. And then he says this, teach what is good. Teach what is good. Now, this is where you have to be extremely careful in discipling people. Because if you're going to call people to yourself to be a disciple of yours and you are making disciples, you better be teaching them that which is good and biblical and not that which is harmful for them. Right? Why, preacher? Because you're going to stand before God one day You're going to stand before him one day and you have the capabilities as a teacher, as a disciple maker to lead people astray. And so you better make sure what you're teaching them in practical nature and theological nature lines up with the word of God so that we can call it good. And there ought to be a seriousness about that. So that's the older men and the older women. And then he comes down in the passage and he says, Oh yeah, by the way, you younger ladies. And and then he says in the text, Who are taught by the older ladies. He says, The older ladies do this so that you can teach the younger ladies these things. To love their husbands and to love their children. See, the example of loving husbands and loving children's, uh, children's, you know, if you got a bunch of them, loving your children is an example that is set for the younger ladies by the older generation of ladies. Can I tell you something, older generations of la- generation of ladies? You're not done yet. You're not, are you breathing? Then you ain't done, right? We need a little help around here. H- hello? So you teach them to love their husbands and to 
love their children. I, I guarantee you the husbands will appreciate it. Amen. Thank you, brother. They ought to be self-controlled and pure. Self-controlled and pure. Preacher, what do you mean? Well, you teach the ladies to submit themselves to the Holy Spirit so that they can be self-controlled, right? But then you're also to teach them to be pure. Say, so what does that mean? Well, it means a lot, a lot of things. They ought to be pure in the way that they conduct themselves. They ought to be pure in the way they behave. Uh, they ought to be pure in the way they dress, in the way they carry themselves. Amen? So in other words, if a young lady, now listen, if a young lady is getting out of line in the way that she is dressing, now understand, listen to what I'm saying. I'm talking about dressing immorally. I'm not talking about, for those of you who think you've got to have a certain thing on, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about being legalistic. I'm talking about if it's something immoral. Get, the man don't need to go address that. The women need to address that in a godly manner. Amen? You don't go up there and say, girl, you need to put something else on. That looks stupid. You don't do that, okay? That's not the way you do it. Hello? You're going to have to leave and go put something else on and come back. That's not how you do it. You do it with love in the manner of teaching them. But listen, that's not the guy's job to do that. Because then if the guy does that, then what's she going to say? Well, what are you looking at? You looking at me? You staring at me? Now, y'all act, like act like I'm crazy. Yeah. You know that's a fact. So it's better for the woman to say, honey, come on. Let's have a conversation. Let's go pray. Let's talk. Teach them those things. <laughs> Be busy at home. Tend to your home. Now, Many of you are going to say, wait, 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 I got a job. Now, I don't just stay at home. I understand that, but the principle still applies. Take care of your business at the house. Amen? Take care of your children. Take care of your husband. Take care of the things that need to be taken care of at the house and make sure you manage your house very, very well. Proverbs 31, go there. She managed her household well. And so we, the, the younger ladies have a, have a charge to do that, and that charge is handed down by the seasoned ladies who have exercised that themselves because they were once young too. And so then it goes on to say this. They ought to be kind. Be kind. There ain't nothing worse than somebody's mean. There ain't nothing better than somebody who's kind. So be kind. Amen? <laughs> Look at me now. Stay off Facebook being ugly. Stay off Facebook making snide comments that you think nobody really knows what you're saying, but everybody knows what you're saying and who you're talking to. Grow up just a little. Hello? Come on, people. Be kind. Be kind. And they're instructed to do that. And then uh, subject yourself to your husband. Be subject to your husband. What does that mean, brother? That means to surrender yourself to the authority of your husband and the leadership of your husband. Pray for your husband that God would lead him and guide him. And as God leads him and guides him, that you would fall underneath that husband's leadership. So that's the young lady. So the older lady, so you've got the older men teaching the younger men. You've got the older ladies teaching the younger ladies. Now, watch this. Why is all of this important? He says it when he's talking about the younger ladies. He said, this is important so that nobody will mock the word of God because of your actions. So in other words, if you're being taught those things by the older generation of ladies, they are discipling you to act in this manner, and yet you're not acting in this manner. What you're doing is you're making a mockery of the Word of God. You're making a mockery of the church of the living God. When you get to the young men, it says that the young men who are taught by the older men, they ought to be self-controlled. You, you kind of see that self-control thing a lot, right? Walking in the Spirit. They ought to do what is good. 
Same principle applies there to the younger women. They ought to do what is good. To the older ladies and the older men, do what is good. They ought to teach with integrity and seriousness and soundness. So they ought to live a life that is a life of integrity. A life that if they are teaching the Word of God to their children, they are teaching the Word of God to other people, that they are teaching that Word with integrity, with seriousness, and with sound doctrines why are they to do that the Bible says so their actions don't condemn them so their actions don't condemn them so when you look at all of this and I'm I'm trying to scurry along but when you look at all of this and all these areas of discipleship you look at it and it's almost as if God has some sort of expectation for his followers doesn't it look like y'all y'all alive out there today It's almost like God expects something of us. After he saves us, he kind of expects us to actually walk in the manner that he wants us to walk in. I mean, that's what it seems like to me. And the reality is he does. God does want us to act in the manner that he wants us to act. He wants us to disciple in a manner that he wants us to be discipled. He he doesn't say in 1 Peter 1.16, Be holy, for I am holy for nothing. He has an expectation of you and I becoming more and more and more and more like Jesus. That's pretty clear to me. You can see this expectation all throughout the Scripture that God wants us to strive toward holiness. And we certainly see the idea of discipling people toward holiness. Now, there's nobody in this room that's perfect at that, but it ought to be a ton of people in this room that's striving to accomplish that with every fiber of their being. Disciple toward holiness. So we see a biblical precedence of discipleship right here as Titus is instructed to set up the church. It's discipleship. So we see that holiness is supposed to be the outcome of this discipleship, but here's some practical steps that I think we can take to help disciple our young people. Y'all want to hear them? Because we got a lot of young people around here that need discipling. So what can we do to disciple some of our young people? Well, the first thing is this. You need to believe in them. The first thing we got to do is believe in them, right? I mean, we live in a world that is so crazy and it's so just out of kilter. A lot of stuff is going on and we've gotten to the point to where we don't even believe in young people anymore. Well, we ought to get to the place to where we believe in them. We believe that God will do something with their life. And when we get to the place to where we believe in them, we've got to help them believe in themselves. See, there's a lot of young people that God could do great things with, but they don't have confidence. They don't believe in themselves. They don't believe that God can do something with them. And so you and I need to disciple them to the point to where we believe in them and we help them believe in themselves. And then we need to equip them. We need to equip them, give them everything they need, man, to do what God has called them to do. Can I tell you, it is a joy. It is one of the joys of my life to try my very best to equip other people to do stuff. It is. It really is. I love it. I love it. And I love to watch when you try to equip people to do what God's called them to do, and then they branch out and start doing it. You almost sit back like a daddy and you go, I'm proud of that. You know? It makes you feel good. It's a process of discipleship. So you believe in them. You help them believe in themselves. You equip them. And then watch this. You release them. You release them. And then the last step. This is important. You revisit them. You revisit them. Once you release them, let them do it. And then revisit with them. Right? Let me give you a a strategy of discipleship that I read in a book. Uh, we, the staff went through this book and staff meeting and it's a great book I recommend it it's called Hero Maker uh, letting somebody else be the hero and discipling in that manner and here's, here's what he says as far as discipling to multiply here it is he says this is the steps I do you watch we talk got it I do it you watch me do it and then we talk the second step is I do you help me do it then we talk okay I do you help me then we talk third step is you do I help we talk fourth step is you do I watch we talk 
The fifth step is you do, somebody else watches. That's pretty good, isn't it? That's a process of discipleship. And it all started with a teacher showing someone else something taking them through the process to where they finally got to the place to where they believed in them, they helped them believe in themselves, they equipped them to do it, they released them, and then they revisited. And I'm telling you, what happens whenever we do this is we spawn off a bunch of people that are desiring to be used by God. They've got people coming alongside of them who is encouraging them how to be used by God, showing them what it looks like to be used by God, releasing them, revisiting them, and sitting back years later going, I remember, I remember when there was a little old boy, and I taught him in Sunday school, and as he grew up, I remember trying to be intentional about pouring into his life a little bit at a time, here and there, a little bit at a time. And as he grew up into the, a man, I went to his wedding, and I watched him get married. And when I was at his wedding, I gave him another little nugget of biblical truth when we were at his wedding. And then he grew up, and I'll be the whole. God called him into the youth ministry. And when God called him into the youth ministry, I came right alongside of him. I poured a little bit more nuggets of wisdom inside of him. I got him to help me do some stuff at that point I helped him do some stuff at that point and now here he is he's 55 years old he's a preacher of the gospel and been doing it for 20 years it's just amazing how it works and listen to me it always works if we do it the way he instructed us to do it amen and so Bonita Road Baptist Church listen discipleship 101 we make sure that we are being the disciple makers that God called us to be. We're living right. We're acting right. We're participating, doing everything we can to grow. And we begin to pour into other people. And discipleship 201 is we pull a few people alongside of us, begin to let them watch our life and teach them how to live for the glory of God and release them and watch God do something amazing with their life. If we ever fail in those two areas... This church won't exist for long. Amen? So it, discipleship is important, right? Now, it's not evangelistic, nothing like that. But there may be some folks that God's put on your heart about discipleship. There may be somebody out in the room tonight, and you say, Brother, I just need to tighten my own life up if I'm going to be a disciple maker. Well, you have that privilege to be able to do that during this invitation. You can do it right there. You can do it up here at the altars. It's completely up to you. But I'm telling you, every single one of us need to be disciple makers. Disciple makers. Those of you who are seasoned people, listen to me. You're not done yet. There's some people that need your influence. So make sure that you're giving it to them, right? Amen?